A second opinion? I can barely afford a doctor's first opinion. Ah. Anyway, doctors who have given a second opinion diagnosis? What's the worst first opinion you've encountered? Story 1. Well, when I first started feeling sick the October of one year at college, I had a non-productive cough, night sweats and trouble sleeping, and I had lost some weight. The school nurse gave me Claritin. All of those symptoms got worse. Plus, I was incredibly fatigued, my lymph nodes swelled up, and I had pretty bad backaches. My GP took a chest x-ray and prescribed antibiotics for pneumonia. At this point, I had almost failed out of school because I was only managing an hour or two of sleep per night. It took until spring break for me to go see a pulmonary specialist. He could instantly tell that it wasn't pneumonia. I had stage 4B Hodgkin's lymphoma. My first PET scan showed cancerous cells and lymph nodes in all four quadrants of my body. At this point, I had lost about a third of my body weight. The cough, weight loss, and back pain were my swollen lymph nodes pressing on my lungs, stomach, and my back. They gave me my first round of chemo, and I genuinely felt incredible. I felt like such dirt that an IV mixture of carefully measured toxins was an improvement. I went home and ate a whole pizza. Chemo got worse, but it worked. So I guess I can't complain too much. Glad you're okay. What a horribly frightening experience that must have been. Stay with us, friend. That's awful to have had such a bad misdiagnosis. The school nurse just giving you Claritin? I wonder if this person managed to get some leniency from the school and able to take some classes over or something. I wonder how well this person did academically up to this point. Story 2. Not me, but my mom. She was always exhausted. The type of exhaustion that she'd have a bath, be so tired from it, she'd sleep on the bath mat when she got out. Went to her doctor, told her, Oh, you're just depressed. Go get a haircut. She did. Still exhausted. Went back to the doctor. Continued to tell her she's just depressed. Get a hobby. It's all in her head, etc. Never sent her for blood work. Never referred her to any specialist. Months later, she goes back. Her doctor is on vacation. Physician relieving her doctor takes one look at her eyes and says, It's your liver. Get these blood tests now. Abnormal blood work and a liver biopsy later, she was told she had autoimmune hepatitis and was three months from perishing. After she improved with medications, she went back to the original doctor and said, I don't need a haircut. 27 years later, she still suffers from lingering effects. All you did to the original doctor was say you didn't need a haircut? Oh, you need to tell that story from the mountains. That doctor needs to learn a little more sympathy for their patients. I'm glad they were able to catch it. It's too bad you're still suffering effects. Story 3. I'm a surgeon. Most patients come to me after having seen another physician who has diagnosed them with something and told the patient to see a surgeon. I've been called to see more than one patient for appendicitis who has already had an appendectomy. I've also been called in multiple cases for patients who very obviously have previously undiscovered very advanced cancer. It's always too far advanced for me to be of help, so I have to wonder, am I being called so I can be the bad guy and explain everything? Yes. The answer is yes. That's awful that he has to be the scapegoat. I'm pretty sure you become a doctor because you want to help people. That's awful that you're being sent people who are beyond your help. Is it these particular doctors that are sending people over, or is he just getting them from all over? Story 4. I have one that happened to me. I did college gymnastics. My senior year, I had an accident in practice landing on my neck. Went to the hospital, got x-rays, was told I was perfectly fine. Walked around in pain for a while. Weeks later, went to another doc, got a new set of images. My neck was broken in three places and had a dislocation. Had a multi-level fusion surgery days later. Found out my x-rays got swapped with someone else's in the ER and I was originally diagnosed based on someone else's images. This was found out when I went to get my records long after my surgery for insurance purposes and my files had someone else's medical records and images in it. Because of the time I spent walking around with it, I had to have a posterior surgery instead of anterior, which is way more invasive and gives me major issues to this day. Story 5. I'm a lawyer, but had a client given a devastating diagnosis of an extremely rare heart condition. Doctors told him he had six weeks to live. 
he contacted me to make his will and set his affairs in order. Thankfully, he sought a second opinion with an extremely well-known cardiologist. I guess the cardiologist was intrigued due to the rare nature of this heart condition. There was nothing wrong with him. He was fine. This poor guy and his family were tortured over this, so devastated and terrified for nothing. He actually called me to tell me all of this. He seemed to be still in the joyous, I'm not going to perish stage. But I imagine anger comes at some point when you take stock of what you went through. I don't know how a doctor fricks that up massively, or if somehow my client's results were mixed up with someone else's, and some poor mongrel's number is almost up and they don't even know it. Story 6. Not a doctor. My sister was about two weeks away from giving birth when she suddenly started feeling excruciating pain and vomiting. I called her midwife, who refused to speak with me, despite my sister clearly not capable of speaking as she sat on the floor next to the toilet, crying and puking. Finally, she just took the phone and was told by her midwife that it was probably just a virus and to eat a popsicle. Eventually, I was able to convince her to go to the ER. She was immediately rushed in the OR for an emergency C-section. Her placenta had abrupted, and my niece was born not breathing, suffered several seizures, and even perished and then was resuscitated. She is now 15 and has cerebral palsy due to going so long without the oxygen she needed. I cannot believe that one. And that one was so preventable if they had gone to the ER early. How long was this midwife a midwife? I hope her reputation and career tanked. Story 7. Patient. When I was in college, I went to the doctor because I was peeing razors. It progressed pretty rapidly, and by the end of the week, I couldn't walk or sleep. The doc asked me about my private life, and I told him the truth, that my girlfriend and I had only been with each other and together for many years. He sort of scoffed at that and told me it was likely chlamydia had a long, condescending speech about safe, spicy time with me, and sent me home. A week later, my pee tests were back. Turns out I had the worst bladder infection they'd ever seen. I had to have a camera shoved up my pee hole, multiple rounds of antibiotics, and to this day, I struggle to pee due to irreversible damage the infection caused. Oh man, that sucks. UTIs are rare in men, but super common for women, and I get like one every other year. I've gotten really good at feeling the beginning of one before it gets worse, and I drop everything and rush to urgent care. They hurt. Story 8. This is the opposite answer, but the best request for a second opinion came from a CVS Minute Clinic. Young, healthy law student goes to Minute Clinic. Has the flu. This was a few years ago. No Rona. Feels awful. They check him out. Yep, he has a fever, aches, sore throat. It's the flu. Flu swab positive. His clinic vitals were notable for a heart rate of 140, a bit high but not crazy high. Reassuring numbers, less than 100. The guy otherwise walked into the CBS and is a young, healthy guy. Would have been pretty easy to dismiss. Anyway, the Minute Clinic says go to the ER. You need an EKG. So the guy follows orders. ER chief complaint is, I have the flu and CVS told me to come here. ER gets an EKG, and he's in slow VT, which is a life-threatening arrhythmia that you have to be shocked out of. They take a look at his heart, and it was giant and barely moving. He had an insane myocarditis. Dude ended up getting cannulated for ECMO within hours. Cardiac bypass machines as life support. I can't say all minute clinics are the same, but holy hell, that was a great save. Story 9. I'm a gynecologist. The number of times I've seen patients pregnant and upset or happy because some other doctor told them they can't get pregnant so they didn't use birth control is appalling. Usually it's family med. Not ragging on all FM docs, just how it goes. I then have to explain that even if the patient has whatever condition that makes it unlikely for them to get pregnant, the odds are almost never zero. Maybe less than 1%, but still not zero, so of course it can happen. I have read stories about all the side effects that all the various birth controls cause. I can understand if someone feels like they have an excuse to not use it at all. The stuff women have to go through to not be pregnant is just astounding. I'm glad at least some people are happy that they got pregnant. Story 10. 
Not a doctor, but my mom went into a walk-in clinic and told the doc she had really bad headaches all the time. She was a stay-at-home mom to me, 10, and my sister, 6, so it was written off as stress and got a prescription for pain pills. Two weeks later, the headaches were migraines. Stronger prescription and try to reduce stress. A few weeks go by and she can no longer get out of bed, throws everything up, including the meds, is completely disoriented and barely alive. My dad was a truck driver, so he was never home. I was taking care of me, my sister, and my mom all by myself. We go back to the doctor, and this lady had the audacity to say this is the weirdest migraine case she's ever seen. Tells her to take warm baths and just keep taking the meds when she throws them up. Two months go by, and my dad came home. Saw the condition of my mother, who was so sick she would urinate herself. The house, which was being kept up by a ten-year-old, and said he wanted a divorce. That night, we found out she had stage 4 lung and brain cancer with a tumor the size of an egg pressing on her brain, as well as many others scattered throughout. I still haven't forgiven that doctor for not taking my mom seriously. Story 11. I just left a practice partly because a woman brought her 8-month-old in for a second opinion. The practice owner had seen the rapidly enlarging sacral soft tissue mass which the mother first noticed about 6 weeks prior. He told her not to worry about it. I checked the notes, which read, Plan. Ignore. I was shocked. There was a new onset rapidly enlarging blue-slash-purple cystic mass on a baby's sacrum. It looked like a small plum under the skin at the top of her bum crack, and without any intervention, my colleague dismissed it. I was appalled. The mother was relieved. This wasn't the first not-great judgment I'd seen, but it was one of the worst. I realized I couldn't work in a clinic where I'd be stepping on other doctors' toes and couldn't trust their judgment. The babies had an imaging and a referral to a pediatric surgeon, but unfortunately, I don't know the outcome because I'm working elsewhere now. Honestly, at that point, I'd pull the mother aside in the lobby and say something like, if it doesn't improve on its own in a few days, I'd find a bigger place to give you a third opinion. Story 12. Told by my doctor, my health issues were stress-related. The second opinion found that my gallbladder was functioning at 3% and had that sucker removed a couple weeks later. What's worse is I specifically asked the first doctor about gallbladder and they assured me it couldn't be that. Gallbladders are notorious for causing a ton of seemingly unrelated health issues. After mine was removed, my life improved dramatically. And now I have to go look up and see what gallbladders do. They function as something but it's kind of weird that we can live without it. I mean, it's not like the appendix. The appendix just seems like that thing that just sits there until it decides it wants to cause problems. But the gallbladder actually seems to serve a function. Do you have to go on medications after you get a gallbladder removed? Story 13. Not a doctor. My husband had a situation where he almost perished because of a misdiagnosis. To preface this at the time, we were young in our mid-twenties living in a college town. My husband had horrible pain. On the floor, on his hands and knees, horrible. We went to the ER, and the doctor barely looked at him and just told him to stop drinking and he would be fine. We go home, the pain is getting worse, and now he's vomiting. As soon as the doctor's office opens back home where we grew up, we drove one and a half hours to see our primary care. Within 15 minutes of walking into the GP office, my husband was rushed into emergency surgery. His gallbladder had completely ruptured and he was going septic. It was a total mess and he almost perished because of a misdiagnosis. Story 14. Not a doctor. Dealt with an unrelated incident and reading a patient's notes found he had been diagnosed with a rare but deadly skin cancer and was booked in to have his upper lip removed. Obviously, this would leave the patient quite disfigured. On a whim, he'd booked in to see a dermatologist at our hospital who advised... It was a cold sore, prescribed aciclover, and the problem was resolved. This one astounds me. Not only because I'm pretty sure doctors are told not to expect a zebra when they hear hoof beats, but also because you'd think they would have run a simple test before major surgery. Story 15. I went to a walk-in clinic because I couldn't swallow anything. The doctor pressed on my forehead and asked if it hurt. I guessed kind of. He told me I had a sinus infection and prescribed me antibiotics that I couldn't swallow and sent me on my way. Turns out, 
I had had a stroke and ended up spending three weeks in the hospital. This is the one that really makes my eyes bulge. Hope you're well these days. I'm getting more and more depressed about this. I know these are all stories that are collected over a single theme, and not all doctors are like this, but just hearing all these stories all at once makes me really want to make sure my insurance and my doctors are all on the level. More than just money, a misdiagnosis can cost someone their time and their life. Story 16. Not a doctor. This happened to my mom like 20 years ago. I believe she was close to 36 at the time and had six kids. My mom was having severe abdominal pain. And if my mom admits to being in pain, then you know it's bad. Her family doctor was on vacation, so my dad took her to emergency. Emergency doctor told her she was constipated and sent her home. The pain got worse, so she went back to emergency a couple days later. She specifically asked the doctor, the same one from the previous time, if it could be an ectopic pregnancy. He laughed at her and sent her home. She ended up in emergency a third time and got that same stupid doctor who accused her of lying to get substances. She had to wait a week until her family doctor came back. Just over the phone, the family doctor could tell something was wrong and told my mom that she wanted to see her first thing in the morning for tests. Mom didn't make that appointment because during the night, her fallopian tube ruptured and my dad found her unconscious on the floor downstairs. He rushed her to the hospital and they found out that she was something like 10 weeks along with an ectopic pregnancy. Our family doctor apparently was screaming at the other doctor in the hallway because of his incompetence. Story 17. Not a doctor, but I went to a dermatologist for a rash on my hands and face. He insisted it was eczema, even though I've never had eczema in my life. He refused to do any testing or take a biopsy. He prescribed me a steroid cream for eczema. The rash spread and got horribly worse. It was all up my arms and all over my face. It was itchy and painful. I went to a different dermatologist and explained the situation. They took a biopsy. It was a bacterial infection, and the first doctor essentially gave me a bacterial infection on steroids. I was a minor at the time, and I don't know why my parents didn't go after the first doctor. Story 18. I'm late, so this may not get seen, but it's a good story. Not a doctor. My grandmother fell from her horse one day. Not a terrible fall, but from the way she landed, she wanted to get checked out. She felt she'd really jolted her neck and spine and was an older lady with fragile bones. Her doctor looked things over, gave her one of those soft neck cushion things, and sent her home. A couple of days later, she decided to get a second opinion. No real reason, she just hadn't felt listened to by the first guy. The second doctor basically took one look at her x-rays and freaked out. He told her they needed to get her immediately into a brace to immobilize her spine. I googled to try to figure out what it was. I think it's a halo brace. But in my memory, it's bigger and more metal than what I was seeing in the pictures. Basically, she'd broken her neck, the same injury that had paralyzed Christopher Reeve, but she wasn't paralyzed because the vertebrae hadn't dislocated. The second doctor said anything that did dislocate it, another minor fall, twisting wrong in bed, would mean being permanently paralyzed from the neck down. She wore her intense metal brace that kept her spine in place for a few months and was totally fine. She lived another 15 years after that. But I think about that story often. The second doctor saved her mobility and her freedom. I hope that they spent some of those 15 years berating that first doctor back to the Stone Age and out of his license. It's good that someone found out, and it's great that she got to live mobile. Did that first doctor not even know how to read x-rays? Please like and subscribe if you've made it this far. I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the video and have a wonderful day. Story 19. Obligatory, I am not the doctor, but I'm the patient. I went to a sleep doctor because I was constantly tired and falling asleep standing up and such. Serious stuff. Doctor was like, well, you're overweight, so it's definitely sleep apnea. I did a sleep study, came back negative for sleep apnea. Doctor was like, Well, I'm still positive it's sleep apnea, because you're a fatty. So he sent me home with a CPAP machine for a month. After a month of using the machine, which records your sleep apnea events every night, and still said I didn't have sleep apnea, and with me having zero improvement in any of my symptoms, I went back to him and he said, 
Well, if this isn't working, I can't help you, because you obviously have sleep apnea, since all turbos have sleep apnea, so you must not be using the CPAP. So I dropped him like a fresh turd and went to get a second opinion. New sleep doc? New sleep study. Came back in, and the new doctor's like, yeah, this is textbook narcolepsy. You have all the symptoms, and the sleep study proves it beyond a shadow of a doubt. I told him about the other doctor, and he said, this is obviously narcolepsy. Your previous doctor was a moron. And unlike the other quotes in this story, that is an actual direct quote. I'll never forget the look of disgust on his face when he said the word moron. Story 20. Also not a doctor. I was diagnosed with MS. Sought out a second opinion, and turns out it was an easily solvable vitamin deficiency. Pretty dang different. $15,000 in medical bills later, only to have all symptoms subside with some nutritional advice and supplements. I'm still salty about it. Story 21. I had a period of about a year where I was getting constant UTIs, which apparently, as a woman in her mid-90s, is normally caused by not peeing after sex. I'm still not sure what was causing mine, but I was not adult play active at all due to vaginismus. My doctor was away for school holidays, and stupidly, I thought I could last a week until she was back. Nope. Two days later, I could barely move from the couch in pain. So, I called a doctor. This doctor, a home doctor because it was a public holiday, refused to hand over the script until I acknowledged that I was being adult play irresponsible. When I said, I am a virgin embarrassingly and potentially dangerous statement to make with a strange man in my house while I was home alone, this jerkwad laughed his butt off and said, No, you're not. Nobody is at this age. Stop pretending to be all innocent. Slammed the prescription on my coffee table and walked out, refusing to give me the starter dose that they're required to carry for people like me who are alone and can't get the prescription until the first dose kicks in enough to begin helping. I called the office to complain, and he did get reprimanded, but holy heck, I was embarrassed. I'm trying to figure this one out. It sounds like the doctor was giving this person the correct diagnosis and the right medicine, but still wanted her to admit she was personally active? It sounds like he's just on a power trip. Also sounds like he's imposing his morality on her. I'd switch doctors there. Forget a reprimand. At least suspend this guy or something. Story 22. Not a doctor, but my sister was suffering from headaches and minor seizures for a while. Went to an urgent care, and they told us she had an anxiety disorder and just needed something to calm her down. We got a second opinion at the ER, and turns out she had stage 4 brain cancer. I miss her every day. Story 23. Posted about this before, but I'll post it again anyway. This is my mom's story, not mine. So my mom used to work for a non-profit clinic that would give free health care to people who didn't have insurance. This guy came in with his teenage daughter, basically saying he was between jobs and the insurance for his new job hadn't kicked in yet, but his daughter was having her yearly case of pneumonia and just wanted her antibiotics. He was really arrogant and rude, saying stuff like, She has a Cuban doctor she usually goes to. My mom is Mexican, and I live in an area where most Latinos you see are Mexican. My mom, staying calm despite wanting to bite the guy's head off, examined his daughter. She noticed his daughter's fingers were clubbed. Google clubbed versus normal fingers. And this was indicative of a serious chronic respiratory issue. Not something temporary like pneumonia. She asked if she could run a few tests just to be safe, and at first he was huffy about it, but was persuaded when my mom told him it wouldn't cost him anything but a bit of time. A few days later, the clinic calls her freaking out because this girl didn't have pneumonia. She had cystic fibrosis. The girl was transferred to a hospital where she could actually start receiving treatment for her condition. It was a minor case. If it was anything more, she honestly could have been unalive by that point. But my mom probably prolonged this girl's life expectancy with a diagnosis. Her regular Cuban doctor had been regularly misdiagnosing her with vitamin deficiencies and pneumonia. Later, the father called my mother and thanked her for helping his daughter. My mom was going off in her head. What about her Cuban doctor, huh, a-hole? But was polite. 
and wished him and his daughter well. Too long didn't read? Not really a second opinion, but when a Cuban guy who was arrogant about being Cuban came in with his daughter thinking she had pneumonia, something she was diagnosed with yearly by her Cuban doctor, my Mexican mother diagnosed her with cystic fibrosis and helped extend her life expectancy. Story 24. Nurse here. I cared for a woman who had been diagnosed with broken vertebrae. She was in a lot of pain, couldn't get her pain under control, and her blood pressure was very low. She'd lose consciousness and be very difficult to wake. I also couldn't get her doctor to answer the phone, middle of the night. Something just fell off about the whole situation. He finally answered and demanded we Narcan her, insisting we'd overdosed her on narcotics, following his orders. I then had a hysterical woman in a lot of pain going in and out of consciousness. I finally walked down to the entrance of the hospital and grabbed the cardiologist who came in at 4.30 a.m. for rounds and said, This isn't your patient, but I think she's going to expire. He came upstairs with me, looked at her and her chart, grabbed the bed and rolled her to ICU himself. I have no idea how the conversation went between the cardiologist and her doctor. She didn't have a broken back. She had an aortic aneurysm, which caused the pain and the low pressure and the loss of consciousness. She perished the next day. Doctors, if the nurse says something is wrong, you might want to lay your eyes on the patient rather than shouting orders through the phone. Oh my god, this is heartbreaking. So basically, this doctor just tried to gaslight the nurses and be left alone. What happens to these doctors? What happens to these people that misdiagnose so callously? It's not like these were mistakes. I mean, honest mistakes. It's like these people just don't want to be bothered. Story 25. Obligatory, I'm not a doctor, but when I had my wisdom teeth out, it was pretty brutal. Like they had to completely put me under, dig deep into my jawbone. The teeth were coming in sideways and upside down, just like the worst case scenario. So I have the surgery, and the next couple of days I'm in a lot of pain, which happens. And I realize I have this growing hot lump on the side of my jawbone. Me being a dumb one, I tried to be like, oh, it'll go away. But it didn't, and my mom caught sight of it and took me back to the guy who did my surgery. Dennis dude took an x-ray, and without even examining it or asking any questions, said I was fine, and it was probably just scar tissue and told me to leave. I thought, hey, well, he's smarter than me, so I guess he's right. My mother, however, did not think this. And so off we go for a second opinion, and while we're headed over to the other office, the hard lump in my jaw bursts, and blood and pus leaks everywhere in my mouth. It was so freaking gross. My mom immediately turned around, drove back to the dental surgeon, dragged me, who was still spitting blood and pus in, barged into the office, and made the dental surgeon look in my mouth. The dental surgeon muttered something about hysterical women seeing things that weren't there, but prescribed me antibiotics and more pain meds anyway. And that was how the one to two week recovery took an entire month, and I ended up having to drop out of a college course due to missing so much. The dental surgeon muttered something about hysterical women? I'm pretty sure this jerkery has caused many endings. Story 26. Like many, not a doctor, but just messed over by many. Got an infected hangnail, so I went to urgent care. I got a shot of an antibiotic and a prescription for another. Took the pill for about a week out of the 10-day dose. On that seven-day mark, I was in my chemistry class, which was at the end of the day, feeling extremely lightheaded, tired, and so dizzy I could barely see. I staggered down the stairs of my high school to see the nurse, but she was out to lunch. I didn't know what to do and had bad attendance due to chronic illness, so I stayed for the next class. Went home on the bus and passed out on my couch. For the next two days, I had a bunch of symptoms. I spiked a fever of 104 degrees Fahrenheit, had a swollen, lumpy throat, in and out of consciousness, vomiting, coughing, and dizziness so bad I couldn't stand. Went in the next night after coming home from school with the fever of 104. Urgent care doctor said that wasn't a treatable fever, that I had an upper respiratory virus that was also untreatable, and told me to go home and not to worry. I wasn't allergic to the antibiotic I was taking because I was taking it for a week and had no reaction before that day. Next night felt even worse. 
Couldn't keep food down. Could barely breathe. Dizziness was so bad I couldn't get up to use the bathroom without being in severe danger of falling. There was also a rash that was going from behind my ears down to my stomach in little red blotches. Went to the ER this time. Also had a yeast infection from the med. Doctor there wouldn't touch me. He barely wanted to look at me. He wouldn't do any kind of exam on me besides look at the rash on my stomach. He said it was measles. Gave me nothing for that. Said there was no way I was allergic to the antibiotic. Sent me home. Went the next day to see my primary doc who squeezed me in due to my symptoms. Talked to the assistant about getting my vitals and symptoms about what was going on. She said I was allergic to the antibiotic. She wrote in my chart that I wasn't supposed to take it. A nurse practitioner came in and listened to my tale of woe. He said I was having a bad reaction and also wrote again that I should stay away from the antibiotic. He said I could have perished, and usually would have because it built up in my system and caused an ending reaction. Doctor comes in and says the same thing. If I take it again, I'll probably expire. Not measles. Not an untreatable upper respiratory virus. Story 27. My dad had a lesion on his leg that wasn't healing. The dermatologist prescribed different antibiotics, pills and ointments, but nothing was working. He did two skin grafts that didn't work. This went on for at least two years. Then my dad got a new dermatologist from the same hospital. She realized that he never had a biopsy. It took her less than an hour to diagnose the skin cancer. The surgeon scooped all the cancer out, another skin graft, and that was it for a while. Since then, he got a lot of other skin cancer lesions, but now he knows what it is. Story 28. Not a doctor, but a patient. When I was in labor with my fourth child, the doctor refused to admit me. I wasn't very dilated and had a history of fast labors. I know when I'm in labor because the pain is different. He gave me a sleeping pill to take and told me to go home and sleep. I refused to leave. The doctor was angry and said he'd admit me, but wouldn't give me anything to augment my labor. My son was born two hours later. Curse you, doctor. Listen to moms. We know our bodies. Story 29. I had the opposite. I'm a midwife and gave a second opinion. The first was received from the woman's GP. She came into the antenatal clinic and said that she'd had a headache that she couldn't seem to shake. She'd called her GP the day before, who had told her to take two Panadol and have a bath and that she'd be fine. Whenever any pregnant woman complains of a headache, especially one that won't go away, it sends alarm bells ringing as it can be a symptom of preeclampsia. Sure enough, the woman also reported seeing blue spots at a blood pressure of 220 over 180 and a huge amount of protein in her urine. I got her to lie on her side in the room I was seeing her in and raced to get a more senior midwife. It wouldn't have been more than 60 seconds that the two of us returned to the room, just in time to see her start having an eclamptic seizure. We called a code pink, obstetric emergency, which then escalated to a code green, alerting theater that we are coming down now for an emergency cesarean, and the woman gave birth under general anesthetic 20 minutes later. I still start sweating when I imagine what could have happened if she hadn't come into the clinic that day. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.